So ladies and gentlemen, welcome Michael Gabriel to the stage, everybody. Super excited to have him on here. Prolific multi-instrumentalist. So welcome to 88.5, the SoCal Sound, at home interviews, as well as Deeper Groove podcast. Welcome, so happy to have you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Cliff. It's great to be of here. Of course. So super excited, uh, chatted with your team for a while, listen to your new record, loving yeah. the, the singles and stuff that have dropped. But tell us a little bit about the latest record, Genesis. What inspired you to create and produce that record? So I've had a collection of hundreds of songs for a long time and never really knew what to do with it. I, I always had wanted to release an album, but it was important to me to have a concept. And it's important to me to have a story to go along with, with, uh, with the songs and not just have a collection of songs, 12 songs on a, on a, on a record. And so <clears throat> at the beginning of this year, I had this sort of revelation. Um, I was, I was kind of going on a, like a, like a spiritual and musical revelation. Um, and on this journey, I said, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to, I want to take the first step in releasing all of my material and what better, what better way to take that first step than with a record called Genesis, which, which means the origin, the, the, the beginning. And so <clears throat> once I had that concept, it was just kind of a snowball effect. Um, the album is kind of, it's, it's, it's part biblical allegory, um, and we can we can I, we can get into that with in the track listing, but um, it's also a personal journey. So those two kind of ideas married together is what birthed the Genesis album. Yeah, and I like what you were saying about the biblical allegory. Uh, when I did my record, the Gospel According to Cliff Beach, it kind of had Bible thematic themes right. in there. Um, so yeah, kind of walk through I guess the track listing and how you equate that to your uh, the the genesis origins right so so much of the so much of the record for me had to do with sentiment and what i wanted to feel when i was listening to a track just myself and <clears throat> when i'm out on tour some of the best bands um that i enjoy listening to are ones that straight out the gate just you know, they come out with all guns blazing. And that's kind of the feeling that I want. And so the, those first couple tracks, um, that's, that's kind of the idea and the sentiment behind that. On an allegorical perspective, you're, you're kind of going from the birth of the universe, the voice of God, the, the voice of the heavens and the divine, and then you're into the humanity aspect a couple of tracks down. And so that's kind of, kind of the short form version of the first like quarter of the record and how it kind of plays out in an allegorical sense. Yeah, and let's take one of the tracks. One of the tracks that I'm going to be playing pretty recently is uh, Let There Be Light. So kind of how did that come together? Well, Let There Be Light, going back to the, to the biblical theme, that's, those are the first words that God spoke. And, you know, when I'm, you're thinking about the birth of the universe, it just kind of, the two kind of go hand, hand in hand. And so it, it was just um, when I had that kind of revelation, it just, I was in the studio at like one o'clock in the morning and recorded this, the whole track in about 30 minutes, uh, you know, because, you, you know, when you're in the zone, you know, things just kind of have a way of working themselves out. So when you say you did everything in 30 minutes, now you're a multi-instrumentalist, obviously influenced by Prince. Uh, and people like Stevie Wonder, people that can just have all that genius in one one package. And so, uh, how did how did you how did you do that so 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 quickly? Do you feel it's part of that divine intervention and the universe speaking to you, or, or how do you feel it came? Out? Yeah, I think it's I think it's all of it. I mean, I'm a multi instrumentalist, kind of born out of necessity. You know, it's like I have an idea and I just need to get it out. You know, it's uh, and, and so that was kind of the case with this song. You know, I uh, I think I had my guitar at the time, and I would just play the riff that you hear in the song, and I was like, okay, I can't really go any further until I have like, you know, some really heavy drums, you know, here. So I went to the drum set and then did laid that down, you know, and then 
you know, finished the guitar part, then added the, the bass. And, you know, it, it's just kind of, it's just a snowball effect. It's like there's not necessarily any rhyme or reason. It's just what I needed to feel in that moment. And that's kind of what I mean by I write a lot of based on sentiment, what I need to feel and what I need to relay that the feeling I need to relay to whoever's listening to it. Yeah, I know that when uh, Quincy Jones was in the studio with Michael Jackson, he said whenever he saw Michael dancing to the tracks, then they knew that they had a hit. Yeah. So how did how did and, knew it was the one? <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I feel like that track, "Let There Be Light," just has so much groove, such as that Lenny Kravitz meets Prince meets meets Michael uh, vibe. That uh, yeah, I can definitely see people moving and grooving to it. Thank you. Yeah, it was fun. So now you've been kind of moving around. I know we were. You know, playing a little bit of tag to catch up with you, but you've yeah. been touring from what I've heard and yep. uh, congrats. I believe that you've been the guitar player for Sheila E, who's also your godmom for yeah. a number of years. So tell us yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, the, the tour has been going great. I've been working with Sheila since I was 16 years old. Um, you know, it started off as a fly in the wall in the studio and and then just kind of built up from there. And, uh, you know, in working with her is just, uh, allowed so many other opportunities from, you know, film to television, to tours, to a bunch of different things. But yeah, it's uh, the, the tour that we just recently finished was in Europe. And it was one of the best tours that I've ever been a part of. It was just great energy over there. Um, we, we love, uh, it, it was mostly in the ne Netherlands. We had a date in Belgium and then the rest were in Holland, but they were all fantastic. All of the all of the the performances were memorable so yeah, yeah. It, it was great yeah I, I heard that you have to tour Europe because they just treat you so well is that true it is I mean they're really into music in a in a different slightly different sense here in the states like they're really uh they're really into take a record for example they're into like the live versions of every song ever produced by a particular artist like that like they'll go really really deep you know and uh you know I, I we have some of that of course here in the states um but they're they're definitely you know in terms of you know prince and sheila e they're definitely prince centric sheila e centric uh fans out there they're very passionate <laughs> nice what's uh what's like a typical set list like what are some of the the jams i mean obviously with Sheila, you have uh the, the hits you know I, I love oliver's house i hope that makes it into yeah a set, we yeah you know what we just recently added that back in and nice. we, have, we have been telling her for years we're like yo that is the jam you know and so many of them you know but she's she's an artist that's always looking forward you know always looking ahead you know, but it's so great to, you know, be able to go back as well. So it's a mixture, you know, I would say, I think it's a pretty healthy mixture of the, the, the hits, some deep cuts, and then some new stuff. Excellent. Yeah. Well, you can't talk about Sheila E without talking about Prince. And apparently you have a huge kind of history with Prince. Prince was your, your, your godfather, rest in peace, rest in purple, but your parents, actually worked with Prince and Sheila. Your dad was like head of security and then managed Prince for a while. And then your mom was a co-lyricist as well as like road manager for Sheila. Yeah. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. The the family oh. ties, uh, yeah, they, they run kind of deep. Uh, so then, you know, having these amazing godparents, like what was it kind of just being like growing up in that world, which not everybody is fortunate to have. So being around such prolific musicians so young. Right. I I don't think I noticed any difference. It was just, it was just normal, you know? Um, yeah, I, I, I get that question a lot and it's weird to answer because I don't know anything. I didn't know anything different. Being, a, being older and able to look back on that now, um, I realize, you know, what a blessing that was. Um, but at the time it was just like any other day, you know, as a kid, you know, you're just like, okay, you know, whatever. Oh, we're going to my kids, for example, I bring them to my show and they're like, oh, dad, when is this going to be done? <laughs> you know? And I'm like, uh, 
you know, uh, it was funny. We played the we played the Grammys, and uh, it that uh, no 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 it was a uh, Prince's Prince's tribute, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Grammys uh, tribute to Prince, and my daughter looks at me and she's like, "Dad, is this live?" I'm like, "No, I, no no I recorded that months ago." <laughs> you know it's like uh no this is this is the this is uh this was recorded when we did the grammys but they're airing it now you know there's just that kind of a disconnect as a kid you know it's like you 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 don't realize that what's happening is unique um Mm -hmm. and not normal Mm -hmm. um but i i am so grateful for the blessing um of being around such incredible musical talent at such a young age i think it definitely um it helps shape and mold me into the person that I am today and foster that musical creativity for sure. So speaking of that musical creativity, besides obviously Prince and, and Lenny Kravitz, some people would mention like, who, who do you think are your musical influences? Man, I find, I find inspiration in, and so I find inspiration everywhere. Um, musical inspirations of course you know you have you have Prince and you have Sheila you have Stevie Wonder you have Led Zeppelin you have the Beatles you have you know um no I find I find inspiration everywhere and not just uh not just in music you know personal experience um you, you, stories movies uh you know books poetry you know I think it's important you know to be open and to be able to receive inspiration from a multitude of sources. It's so interesting to me, you know, you talk about Led Zeppelin, you talk about rock and roll. I think that genre has become kind of uh, ethno-specific, but then people forget like the history. So rock and roll really is part of the, the African-American root, but right. you know, at certain, at certain points it moves on. Same with blues, same with jazz. And, ha- ha- and uh, just really, quick i don't want to uh digress but have you seen that documentary on that band a band called death yes yeah yeah it's dope yeah and you look at that you're like oh we're in detroit in 68 but right we have nowhere to go because we're black and you're not playing motown right right so it's tough it's tough uh you know with uh with just music should be universal and people want to play it and they feel a certain way then than, than, than let them, but uh, but yeah, I love to see people that are not pigeonholed necessarily one one genre, and I think that's what I loved about Prince. You know, Prince, the Rainbow Children album was amazing, you right. know, as jazz, and uh, and I think people slept on a lot of those records because people want to put you in a box and what they remember, and uh, but as an artist, you have to continually to progress. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah music. You're right. Music is. A universal language. I mean, the the cool thing is that you know that record exists, you know, and it's accessible. You can access it. You you can tap into that well, you know, uh, for for continued inspiration. Um, but yeah, you know, I I feel like you know genre is just another tool for creative expression, and I. I don't really like to be bound by the limitations of, of genre. I think of genre as like just another tool, like an instrument, like guitar or bass or whatever. It's just a tool used to be able to express whatever idea, feeling, or sentiment that you want to put across. Yeah. Now you have been playing music a long time. Obviously you have origins. Did you start with one instrument first and then others or? It was guitar. How did that work? Okay. Yeah, no, it was, it was guitar for sure. Um, you know, I was, a, I was a, you know, just a little kid when, you know, the live performance of Sign of the Times came out. And so like, that was like everything to me when I was growing up. And so I ran around with a little plastic guitar playing it upside down backwards and whatnot. And, you know, my folks were like, huh, I think he might have a future as a guitarist. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how it all began. Guitar is definitely my first love. And an amazing instrument. I mean, I think definitely a melodic instrument would make sense as the first guitar, piano. Right. And then Sign of the Times, yeah, an amazing 
amazing record and they've done the live and the the extended i love the shaka khan remake of that song as well yeah um, done by jimmy jam terry lewis who obviously she was also produced and on paisley park at one point so it's like a whole family uh yeah. affair the paisley park maven staples also amazing if people haven't heard it just just in general but now now you've done an amazing amount of collaborations with Sheila E and, and her whole family, Stevie Wonder, Ringo Starr, Beck, Common, Gary Clark Jr., Snoop Dogg, Miguel, Her, Earth, Wind & Fire, Gloria Estefan, George Duke, George Clinton, like just a laundry list of, of, of people and it's all amazing. So how is it to kind of even kind of rub shoulders and collaborate with any of those amazing luminaries? It's it's great. You know, that the most talented people I, I've noticed, like there's a trend, the most talented people are the most humble as well. And that that's just it's uh it's cool to be able to be in the same room as uh, you know, some of these incredible artists and kind of, you know, feel their energy. And I think it's a, it's been important to me to try to take something positive from each of those experiences and carry it on with me to the next thing. You know, uh, I mean, we're all here to learn and grow and whatnot. And I'm just incredibly uh, grateful. I feel I feel nothing but gratitude for the experiences I've been able to have. Is there one particular time or one particular artist you worked with that stands out in your mind? Oh, I mean, it's it's like, I don't know, it's a tie between Stevie and like Ringo Starr. I, th I think, you know, the the first time I met Stevie, I was I was like. 17 or 18 years old and it was at a restaurant it wasn't even like in a working environment or anything like that and I I shook his hand and I swear like I didn't wash my hand for like a week I was like I don't know what to, I don't need I was like are you supposed to I think you know maybe I'll just wear a glove the rest of my life and you know just so I can kind of have some of that you know um and then uh you know Ringo it was uh we we drove up to his complex um we were redoing uh, a song of his on Sheila's record, actually. Um, it was uh, Come Together. And so we drove to his complex. Um, the gate is, you know, graced with stars and the road has a big star in the, in the middle of it when you're driving down. And I open the door and who do I see? Like, like right there is Ringo. And he just gives me a big hug. Like he's, like he's known me all my life. I did, I've, I've met him a couple of times before we worked together. Um, but it was just, it was just really cool. Like, it's just such a, such a genuine human being, you know, and then, you know, to be in the same room and know that of all the music that he helped create, you know, it's like, that's this, like the soundtrack of, of my life almost, you know, when you think about the Beatles catalog. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, th those two are, you know, are definitely on the top of my list. Yeah. And Beatles, I mean, both the catalogs are amazing for sure, but with Beatles, you're like, wow, they really did a lot in a very small amount of time. Same with Jimi Hendrix. You're like, well, he really only had like a handful of albums, but just sometimes you just say a he, lot. He made like, his he made a stamp on the world. Yeah, he put his stamp on it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so then, kind of explain to us your musical progression because you've only been releasing records for the last couple of years since around 2019, or did you have stuff before? I had yeah. stuff out a while before. Like I think I put some stuff out in like 2008 or two, 2009, you know, um, around that. But, you know, your musical kind of tastes change and then you go, oh, I don't, I'm not into that anymore. And then you take it down or whatever. It's you're probably floating around on there somewhere. Um, but yeah, my, my musical progression, it's constantly fluid, I think, you know, just what I'm into, the sound that I like and whatnot. You know, this this particular record, I I knew I wanted to go for that sort of Minneapolis sound vibe, you know, funk and rock and roll. It was kind of like the, the you know, my aim, you know, in terms of a vibe for the record. Um, you know, and as far as like the next record, you know, I'm sure I'm I'm sure some of that's still gonna bleed into the next thing, you know, but you know, I have the problem I have now is I have so many songs that, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to add to, uh, I'd like to put on a record, you know, um, but with this record, over half of the songs are new, you know, because we're, 
in a constant state of creativity, you know, I, you get it as a musician right. and as an artist, right. it's like, you know, I love this song, you know, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not there right now. You know, I'm not, that's not what I'm feeling right at this moment, you know? So, you know, I gotta, I gotta just be true to who I am in this moment and write what fits, you know, the feeling I want to put across now, you know? Um, so like there were a handful of songs that just so happened to fit with the concept of this record and the whole vibe and everything like that. But there were a lot that were like, okay, I guess I got to shelve you until I can find a home for you. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. Uh, yeah. You mentioned being from Minneapolis and the Minneapolis sound and obviously France, Purple Rain, Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, The Time. Uh, artists that people don't think of, like Bob Dylan, I think has some roots there. Mm -hmm. Lizzo worked with Prince and was there mm -hmm. for a while. Um, like, what what is, I guess, the Minneapolis sound, and also just what's the vibe there? I want to I want to say something quippy. You know, so somebody asked Prince, you know, what is what is funk, and it's like if you have to explain it, it ain't funky, sort of thing. <laughs> I mean, the, the Minneapolis sure. sound is kind of kind of kind of that you know it's like you know it when you hear it you know i mean it's it's a it's uh you know two and four is important like if i'm talking about it from a technical and practical sense musical sense yeah you, you know you got to have that backbone that's two and four and then you know so go in between major and minor sort of harmonies and whatnot and then that funk guitar and whatnot you know that's kind of kind of the vibe if I were to try to verbally explain it but you know it's it's one of those things that it's like you know it when you hear it more more or less you know the vibe here um you know the the music is still alive and well in Minneapolis you know there's still a lot of great talent here um you know sometimes it gets slept on you know because we're not we're not LA you know we're not Nashville you know, but we're Minneapolis, you know, we don't have to be LA, we don't have to be Nashville, where it's its own thing. So, you know, don't sleep, don't sleep on, don't sleep on us. <laughs> nice. Well, I've never been, but it definitely sounds like there's a history and arts, museum, cultures, and, and the clubs, the clubs mm -hmm. that, that, are, that are still around, that have been there for, yeah. for quite a yeah. while. They're, yeah. they're always still pushing an envelope and, and pushing out new talent. Yeah, uh, there, there's a, you know, kind of, city famous you could say world famous uh, but bunker is a small club downtown it's always something happening over there you can go there every night and hear some some great new music yeah i love the small hole in the walls no frills intimate uh, i love seeing artists that like now are big when they were small like right. i feel like you never get that again like john legend was that what, like House of Blues when he first did his first tour, or even smaller? And you're like, wow. uh, you know, I think that's one of the reasons Prince loved playing clubs, you know, is was because like that, it just felt like home, you know? And it's a little more freeing. It's like, you know, I can, this, this is my creative space. I'm inviting you into my home, my living room, and we can just, you know, create music. Definitely. Yeah. So just in general, I, from artist to artist and for everybody listening, doing music is not easy, for sure. There's a lot of ups and downs, feast of famine, there's a lot of obstacles. Obviously, the pandemic was a huge obstacle. Where right. we go? We can't tour. Um, so like, how do you stay encouraged and motivated to keep going? That was a that was a tough one, especially during the pandemic. Um, we went from we went from playing the Grammys and like, you know, it's arguably one of the, the world's biggest stages to being completely cut off. Like we had our calendar was booked solid with uh, touring with Sheila. Our calendar was booked solid um, for the entire year. And then, you know, we all know what happened. Um, I think there was a lot of denial at first. And I'm speaking specifically in regards to the pandemic, but, mm -hmm. um, you know. Uh, then there was the acceptance piece, you know, and what got me through it, what was just creating, was just sitting at the piano, was just, you know, playing, playing my guitar. Songwriting is something that just the act of trying to take what's inside and put it out into, you know, some type of physical form is 
is something that kind of keeps me encouraged and inspired. I mean, we, when you think about it, we as human beings, musicians have this ability to create something literally out of nothing. We're bending air. You know, I, I don't mean to get too deep on it, but like we're, we're bending air. We're making mechanical vibrations in the air. And that's, that's what music is. Like it's, it's literally nothing, but your creative soul, what's inside of you, you know? So, um, you know, trying to be open to receiving whatever it is that I need to receive at the time to be able to act as a conduit and a transducer to get that message out was enough to kind of keep me going in, in the pandemic. Um, and it's enough to keep me going, you know, even outside of pandemic related stuff, you know, my, my family, my kids, you know, my wife, all of those kind of wholesome, you know, more wholesome personal things, you know, keep me going as well. You know, uh, my faith keeps me going. Um, you know, it's a combination of a lot of different things. That's good though. That's a good, that's a good mixture. When you look at like the life of the pie, all those different buckets and segments kind of. Right. Like yeah. It's, it's not just one thing, you know, I'm sure you can attest to that as well. Yeah. I think we're learning that we, we're sharing this experience and journey through life. And there's a lot of synergies and uh, similarities, you know, right. Regardless of culture or ethnicity, I think at our core, we're basically all the same. Right. Uh, you know, and in the, during the pandemic, that was especially true. You know, we were kind of all experiencing this same sort of thing all together, even, even though we were isolating and isolated and whatnot. I think we all got to the point where it's like, hey, we're, we're all going through this same experience together, you know, and there was something, you know, kind of kind of comforting about that, you know, in a, in a weird way. You know, it's like we're even though we're separate, we're still together, you know, sort of thing. Oh, for sure. Yeah. My mom sums it up best. She says, we were all in the same storm, but not in the same boat. Right. Right. So I was like, wow, that's a good way to right. think about it. I ask everybody some rapid fire questions just for the next generation. Sure. Uh, what would you tell a newbie starting out in music today? Uh, record yourself every chance that you get. Um, I think it's important to be able to hold a mirror at your your plane and your development. And so I think the more that you can record yourself and listen back and um, is, is important and take advantage of the technology age that we live in. You know, you have you have a wealth of musical professors that you can just have access to via YouTube and you can slow it down and all those things. It's like so take advantage of technology and record yourself. Oh, man, the youth know nothing of the grind of heavy wow. vinyl, uh, going to the library, like yeah. not being able to Dude, just click it a click. Pull people up don't, they don't understand it or cassette, you know, it, it gets unraveled and you have you to, to use the pencil, you know, it's like, or the pinky. It's like, yeah, yeah. man, they don't know. Struggle. Don't. For real. <laughs> yeah. Or a track. There was no rewind. Oh, you just had yeah. to listen to it. That's it. Back. Yeah. You had to keep driving around. At least gas yeah. was cheap. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, so then what do you want your what do you want your legacy to be? Obviously, you're super young and it's going to be a long time. But at the very, very end, what do you want people to to say about Michael? Jesus? Oh, man. You know, I've been so busy living in the moment. I haven't really, you know, thought that far ahead. But, uh, you know, I think uh, just my hopefully my music will be my legacy. Like I said, I, I have so much material and it's, uh, you know, I just, the pandemic gave me a chance to really kind of reflect. And I realized that it was really important for me to be able just to get this out there, you know, just to get these musical ideas, these feelings, these thoughts out into the world. So this record is the first step of many um much more material that i'm going to be putting out so i would say my music okay so when you when you think that and obviously knowing a lot about prince how do you feel about posthumous record releases i think he even said you know it's like you know it's probably not going to be me that's putting it out but 
you'll hear it eventually. You know, I, I think he said that in an interview. They, they were just ideas and thoughts and feelings. It was a moment that you were capturing, you know? So I, I, as long as it's done in an honorable and respectful way, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's good. It, it can be, it can even be important, you know, because maybe it's something somebody else needs to hear. You, you don't even know it, you know, it's like, you know, sometimes for me anyway, I make music with very kind of selfish intentions. You know, I'm just, I'm doing it for myself. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, this is something that I, I like, you know, whatever. But, you know, imagine never hearing September, Earth, Wind and Fire. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, imagine, you know, never hearing Let It Be. You know, imagine, you know, Hotter Than July, that album never existing just because, you know, it's like, oh, I just made this for me. You know what I mean? You never mm -hmm. know how it's going to affect somebody else. You That's know, true. and, and, you know, in a way it's like, and especially when you put it out there, then it's like, it really doesn't belong to you anymore. It's belongs to everyone to kind of share, you know? So I think, I think it can, I think it can be cool if it's done in the, in an, in an honorable way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I, as a fan, I love it for sure. As a musician, I think maybe they're like, Hey, there's a reason why I didn't put this out. I don't yeah, want this that, out yeah. I, I, I get that too, you know? But you know, you got you got to think. You know, it's like he, you know, I I I definitely can't speak for him or anything like that. But you know, he could have he could have destroyed it all. You know what I mean? But he he saved it. You oh, know, yeah. and, all uh, great artists have it. Stevie, yeah. I'm sure they're going to crack that vault. Every, right. Everybody, every Earth, Wind, and Fire, everyone, everyone has something. But Prince, man, they got a lot going on. I think Third Eye with Jack White is putting out a Camille album. In, in its entirety. And then, uh, yeah, they did a, I don't know, a demo of I Feel For You, it's acoustic, and, and you can just hear the progression of, of right. where that went. Or the whole demos album that they did, that he did for other artists. It's nice to be able to understand like the origins of, of songs. Because when you think of I Feel For You, from the demo to the Prince version, to the Shaka Khan, I mean, there's like so many evolutions. Right, yeah, yeah I know, yeah. It's 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 pretty incredible. I mean, it's it's cool for is from a musician's perspective. It's kind of cool to be able to. It's almost like you're a fly in the wall in the studio and the you know development of this material, and it's it's insightful, you know. Um, and even um, you know, I'm sure you've heard a few of the the uh, Michael Jackson multi tracks, mm -hmm. and it's cool to be able to kind of isolate each one. And you're like, oh wow, it's like and and you know individually they might sound like, you know, maybe it doesn't sound like anything particularly special separately, mm -hmm. but then yeah. you start stacking those layers and you're like, Oh my gosh, just like, it's, it's a surreal experience. You're like, Oh wow. This is, this is magical uh, almost like the way this is coming together. Um, and, you know, by the time you, you know, unsolo all of them, you're like, wow like i have a whole new perspective on this track you know and a new yeah. appreciation for it too and work ethic i mean right your demos sound better than people's best day <laughs> right 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 but here's the other thing i i i, I want to just say really quick is that uh you know going back to you know some of those iconic and legendary artists it's like we're so focused on perfection in this day and age, you know, and I'm not like knocking any production techniques or anything like that, but I found, at least in my experience, the perfection is actually in the imperfections. Mm -hmm. um, that's where you get the, the magic. You know, if you're like, if you're working on a track and it's like, oh, this isn't, you know, perfectly in time or per perfectly in tune even, you know, it's like, you know, and then you go and, you know, slap your, you know, perfect everything on it. At least from personal experience, I've gone, oh man, now I've just sucked the life out of the song. Like, oh, thank God there's an undo in the 21st century. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so yeah. it's like embracing, you know, embracing, you know, the imperfection, you know, because sometimes that's where the magic, the real magic is. Yeah, for sure. And I think that is some of the, the downsides of technology when you think of uh, 
auto tune and, and melodyne. You do right. lose a piece of the soul and you lose a piece of the idiosyncrasies and the voice that we used to to, to treasure. Some people were naturally flat, naturally sharp. Right. Some people just had like raw emotion, maybe not necessarily the best uh, instrument. Right. And uh, I think when you're striving for perfection, I think Leonard Cohen, he said it like, you know, we need the cracks. That's how the light gets in or something to that effect. Like it's right. True. Yeah. Ma imagine slop slapping autotune on Bob Dylan. Oh, <laughs> call it a night. <laughs> Unplug it. We got to go. There will be no, no good. That's also something about Bob Dylan. Like when you think of his songwriting and skill, he did not have the voice, but he had charisma and chops of writing and, and relaying a message. But then when you hear other people like Jimi Hendrix all on the watchtower or Adele, uh, make you feel my love. You're like, oh, that's that's what that song's supposed to sound yeah. like, man. You, right. You've owned it. And the same when you hear, uh, you know, Sinead O'Connor cover Prince. Like, oh, that's that's what that vibe is. Or right. I don't know, Nina Simone covering Screaming Jay Hawkins. You're like, wow, that's so different. You right. Elevated yeah. To a different thing. But that's why yeah. I think there was times where people would do these covers a lot because a song, if it's good at its core, can can really go into different genres the different voice types and, and moods a good song is a good song yeah you know a good song is 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 just that you know a good a good song sounds good with just one instrument and a vocal you know mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. imagine yeah, sure. that for sure so how can people find you online where do they go to connect uh my website michaelgabriel.com my socials michael gabriel it, I, I think that's my handle for everything uh instagram twitter facebook TikTok, YouTube, all of that. Well, that's the beauty of your parents spelling it slightly different. Uh, yeah, with a Y. Yeah, so remember yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Michael with a Y. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael, it's been a pleasure, Michael Gabriel. Thank you for being on the podcast. Yeah, 885, the SoCal Sound, at-home interviews, Deep Grooves podcast. We hope to reconvene and keep connected about your career with the team. We'll circle back on all the links throughout so we can get it out into the zeitgeist and universe but yeah keep making music keep doing what you're doing love the sound love just your your energy and who you are as a person which i think is even more reflective in the music you know it's more about uh being than doing yeah thank you so much quiff i really okay appreciate I, it. I i accept them all i accept <laughs> them all thank you so much michael we'll talk soon thank you cliff all right Take care. bye, bye.